Hey guys, Young Blood with you for the 35th episode of The Inbox, and today we're going to start off with a question that seems to be a little bit provocative, but based on the responses and the questions he was asking as follow-up, I think it's actually pretty genuine. So, um, the question overall is, will this game be pay to win? Now, it's a question that comes up a lot, because we see a lot of really expensive ships and uh, people that are stocking up on various uh, ships, so I think it's kind of a natural question to ask. And, you know, based on some of the games that we've seen released, um, you know, whether mostly free-to-play games, um, there are a lot of, you know, I guess, realistic concerns about pay-to-win. Now, in Star Citizen, I think the number one thing to address this question is, is when you're talking about an MMO, open-world type sandbox space universe, there's not really a win. There's not an end game in sight. Now, if you could say, okay, can you pay to have the best cargo hauler? Can you pay to have the best combat ship? Well, in a way, yes. But the things that you need to remember is every ship has different purposes. And the one thing that's going to trump everything in this game is going to be player skill and intelligence. So if you want to talk about cargo hauling as an example, you may just say, okay, well, nothing compares to the whole E and the sheer cargo hauling ability. So is that the number one ship to win at cargo hauling? Um, the, and the answer is no, there is no number one ship because when you talk about the whole series, you've got your cargo that's uh, slapped on the outside of the ship so it's not as well protected. Um, you don't have a whole lot of weapons on it to you know, deal with threats that are coming in to attack you. The whole E can't land on a planet, so it's going to be limited there. Um, it's probably not going to be super maneuverable, so you're going to have issues there. It's also going to be restricted by the jump point sizes that you can go through. Um, so whereas you know a Banu Merchant Man may end up being a better option for hauling large amounts of cargo. Now, it's never going to have the same amount of cargo as a whole E. Um, because nothing is, but um, it does other things better, like it's a known blockade runner, it's supposed to be faster, it's going to be more durable, it's going to be able to land on planets, and those are the types of things that kind of help to balance things out. You can even talk about sizes of ships, for example, and say, yeah, the whole E carries more cargo, but guess what? The freelancer may be able to go through the smallest jump point size, so it could probably do two or three cargo runs in the time it takes the whole E to do one. There's a lot of factors to take into account there. And if you want to talk about combat ships, you know, we can, I'm going to not spend too much more time on this, but if you want to talk about combat ships, you know, something like the Super Hornet is a really good brawler. Um, it's not fast though, so you're not going to be able to chase people down. It's, um, you know, probably limited in the overall range, so you may be able, able to only do a couple jumps before you have to go refuel. You know, compare that to something like a, I don't know, Avenger. You know, the Avenger may end up being able to swap out those missiles and put on drop tanks so you can extend your range. It also has the ability to carry some cargo or prisoners in a bounty hunting way. There's just way too many factors in this game to say that it's pay to win. On top of the fact that everything that you can earn in game you can buy, or I'm sorry, everything you can buy with real currency you're going to be able to get in game. So the bottom line is you can pay to have an advantage to start. And what I mean by that is you can pay to have more ships that can customize to certain roles. Um, and then you're going to be able to do that. But once the game releases, you're not going to be able to buy ships with money. All the money that's being generated now is being funneled back into development. So the answer is no. You can pay to have an advantage when you start, um, but in the end, in the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's not a pay-to-win game. Uh, let's see. Joppy9999 says, uh, I encounter a lot of bugs in the current 2.3 build. You can tell I'm a little behind on questions. Uh, glitching out of my Mustang, ships not being able to spawn because of ship limits, a lot of disconnects and crashes. Do you think most of this will be fixed in 2.4 or mainly features will be uh, added and fixes will come later? Well, we're in 2.4. We're looking forward towards 2.5 now. And I think what we saw in the release of 2.4 was they addressed a lot of the bugs and issues that were there. Now, we ended up getting some new bugs and glitches in, in place of those, but we got a whole lot more content. And I think that's what we're going to see in every single one of these releases. We're going to see new content coming in the big update, so going from 2.4 to 2.5, along with some fixes to some issues that are in place. And then their goal is to have subsequent releases like 2.5.1 or 2.5.2, and those are going to be the ones where you're actually seeing like the hot fixes to most of the problems and issues that we're facing. So you're going to see both, basically, where new content is being added and fixes for the problems that are present are coming in, and we're, we're seeing an improved environment. I mean, 2.4 is much more stable than 2.3 ever was for me. Um, I think most people probably feel the same, but it's coming. It's getting better in both, one, in both of those aspects. Uh, Monty Pescador says, uh, basically says, uh, question for me as an adoptive father. Congrats. Thank you. Um, uh, he basically talks about how he wants to do things as a family. 
um, you know, talking about long term as things stand with ships right now, concepts and all. What do you think the best bets are for family play, counting uh, a wide variety of play options? You know, he's thinking about the Aquila or the Carrick. So when we talk about family play, it kind of depends because there's a lot of different things you can do. But ultimately, what you're talking about is a multi crew ship. And some of that's going to be dependent on how big your family is. So if you're playing with a family of 10, you need a big ship. Um, but if you're playing with three, four people, something like that, uh, you know, there's a lot of options that are out there for you. Now, the uh, Aquila is a really, or Aquila is a really good uh, exploration ship. The Carrick's a really good exploration ship. I think both of them are outstanding options. And from a family perspective, if there's younger people that you're playing with, it's likely to be a less violent type of gameplay. So I think that's a really safe bet, and I think those are two really good options for you. Um, if you're talking about uh, you know smaller, like two or three people that you're playing with, then maybe something like a freelance or dur could be a cheaper way of getting in and basically accomplishing the same thing. Um, then you get other ships that I think are going to be capable of taking on a lot of different roles, like something like the Caterpillar would be a really good option to consider because it's going to have the crew size that you need, like five or less, and it's going to open you up to a ton of different gameplay options dependent upon how you actually customize your modules. So, you know, if you want to go out and explore, you can probably add on modules that'll help you with that. If you want to do salvage or mining or cargo missions, you have the ability to do that. So I think for me, the Caterpillar is probably one of the better options that you could pick for um, what you're wanting to accomplish. Uh, Nick Morley says, uh, now that TIG has made over 113 million, do you think uh, production will increase? Maybe another studio somewhere, Canada, hopefully. Um, I don't know if you're going to see any more studios being added. My gut says no. Um, as far as the population of developers being increased, they are constantly adding more and more people. Um, you know, I think when we're looking at the Around the Verse episodes 100, 101, 102, 103, um, those are all basically doing studio, um, I guess, recaps. And you're starting to see the size of the operations that are in place. So you get an idea that there are a lot of people that are there. Now, what I think is going to really increase the production is once Squadron 42 is actually ready for release, you're going to see a lot of those people working on assets for the, per the Persistent Universe. And I think that's when you're going to see the production really start increasing on the MMO portion of this game. So I think it's more, um, it's more a question of the schedule and how they're utilizing their current population of employees as opposed to more dollars mean more employees means faster development. Uh, Mario Lara, uh, Lara says, uh, Youngblood, not sure if you saw my question in a much earlier video, wondering whether the top five ships you're looking forward to to get with in-game credits when the game is officially released. Um, so there's a lot of them. It's kind of a tough question to answer because I'm not sure what I'm ultimately going to have when the game releases. I melt and buy and trade and do a lot of those things to try and get my lineup to where I want. And then every once in a while you get a wild card that gets thrown in. Like for example, the Polaris is coming and it's likely going to be very expensive. So I may end up melting a bunch of ships and that may open me up to needing to earn things in game. Um, some ships that I'm definitely not planning on buying, but I really want um, would be like an Idris, for example. I really would like to get my hands on an Idris, but um, I just can't spend the money on one, so I'm going to be uh, earning that in-game. Um, a Carrick probably is going to fall into that category as well, um, just because I, I, I need to draw the line somewhere. I like the idea of the Carrick. I like the look of the Carrick. I like the capabilities of the Carrick. Um, a whole E, um, you know, I want a big-ass cargo hauler, so if I want to really just focus on earning income, um, I can pick up a whole E and really do that through the cargo trading. Um, a reclaimer falls in the same category. The uh, I don't have anything right now that does salvage outside of potentially like a caterpillar. Um, and then I would also say maybe like an 890 jump just for the luxury kind of fun side of it. Um, or maybe like an Endeavor. Basically, some of those top-of-the-line ships that appear to be really specialized in their roles, um, I personally tend to value versatility over this special, the specialist outside of combat. Um, so I think those big expensive ships that focus on roles are going to be the ones that I'm going to try and earn in game with credit. So like the Orion would be another example. Uh, Sterling uh, Mogford says, will there be any need or ability to navigate by other means than uh, electronic waypoints? Um, as far as the ability to do so, your ship's system is going to allow you to use waypoints. You're also going to have your Moby Glass that will allow you to use waypoints. So I think that allows you to have a certain level of redundancy that's going to help you have backups. Now, if you want to talk about a need to be able to do it in other ways, there's probably things that are going to come into place. And we kind of start getting some teases of that as they continue to add more content. For example, every ship is going to have a beacon. So if you want to play with uh, somebody, you may be able to just push a button, put out your broadcast beacon, and somebody's then going to be able to navigate to your location 
which is in a way an electronic waypoint, but it's not necessarily something that you're setting. Um, you know, you could also look at it and say, as far as the need, let's say your ship gets uh, damaged and your sensors go down, you may end up needing to rely on your Moby glass because that's separate, even though there's probably some integration between the two components. So that could maybe help you find your way home. Or in, let's just say, a real emergent type of situation, if you're flying, you get maybe uh, electronic warfare and your systems go down and you're trying to look around to figure out what your best escape vector is. And you know that there's a security post at um, the moon off to your right. You know, you can start planning just visually where you want to go. So as soon as your ship's systems are back up, you can haul ass and get out of town as fast as possible. There's going to be those types of situations that are going to help you out. Um, but ultimately, it's going to just be, um, you know, what type of situation you find yourself in and what the level of integration between the different components are. Uh, and then for our patron questions today that were submitted uh, via the patron exclusive Discord channel, uh, the first one's a pretty quick one, uh, Captain Gridginski. Uh, I was curious if the game uh, will give us the ability to have banners before or after our name. So, example, John becomes Commander John. Um, I don't think this is one that we're actually going to see in game. I think what we may end up seeing is like uh, a dossier. So, when you look at a player and you're looking at their reputation, there may be different things that are there. So once you've accomplished a certain level of things as far as like the trading type of role, you may end up getting a certain level of reputation associated with that. So like in Elite Dangerous, we see like Merchant is a level and, um, oh God, it's been so long since I've played, but other like trading names or for Explorers, like Pioneer is a title that ends up getting added. Those might be type of accomplishments that end up getting added, but it's probably not going to be in front of your name. It's probably part of your overall dossier as a character. Additionally, I think one that we might end up seeing is for those of us that have actually completed Squadron 42, you may end up being considered, um, you know, a, a civilian as opposed to people who just jumped into the MMO. They may just be a citizen. You know, we kind of look at the uh, uh, Starship Troopers example, you know, serve and earn that extra, you know, that extra recognition and the ability. So those might be things that get added. But again, I don't think it's going to be like I'm looking at a player across the map and I'm seeing them as Commander John. It's probably going to be more, hey, there's John. When I look at his reputation, there's some additional information about him there. Uh, Garian says, question about EWAR missiles. Um, do you have any information about active jamming or active ECCM? Situation one, uh, I want to protect my friend's whole D with my Vanguard Sentinel as he's being fired upon. Will that be possible? Um, and situation two, I want to support a wing at gladiators and retaliators by adding their, or aiding their missiles and torpedoes with my sensors. Is that possible? We don't know a ton about electronic warfare to this point. Um, I did a video on this quite a while ago about the types of E-War that they were putting into the game and what some of those countermeasures were. And the only real counter that they talked about as far as electronic warfare was like uh, countermeasures. So like flares, um, chaff, um, and those types of things. So I, I don't know if you're going to be able to use your Sentinel to disable missiles as they're coming in. But then we look at the description of the Sentinel and we say, okay, it's also kind of known as the Trickster. So does it have the ability to do that? Maybe. But honestly, I don't think the development is anywhere far enough along. That being said, um, Robert seems to really appreciate skill-based gameplay. And if you want to talk about opening up the gameplay to different people, having a turret gunner on the Sentinel being able to actually track those targets and try and disable, or those targets being the missiles, before they actually end up landing on the other ship could be a possibility. I can't say yes, it's going to happen because I don't think they know at this point. Um, and then as far as the second question goes, I want to support a wing of gladiators and ret retaliators and using their missiles. I think certain ships are going to allow you to do this. Um, you know, I think, for example, something like a Hornet tracker taking advantage of that dish to be able to almost act as like a um, AWACS station or something like that is po probably a possibility. You know, we get a little idea of something like that sort of uh, feature when we look at the Willis Op systems on the 325 and having the ability to use the advanced targeting to actually launch missiles at multiple targets at the same time. So you may end up getting an increased capability of a bomber by utilizing another ship's systems as long as there's a certain level of integration between them that can happen. I think we can see enough pieces um, and discussions that they've had to let us know that that probably is going to be an option in the game. Um, but it, until we actually see those being released, we can't say positively, but I think it makes a lot of sense based on what we know today that you would be able to help out that process. And for the last question today, it's from Alpha509. Um, so I went ahead and pledged for an Aurora because it was a uh, time and it was kind of the ship that I could do a little bit of everything with. Um, but now all of these newer ships are being released. It seems like every ship can do what the Aurora can do and then some. 
What do you think of the Aurora's place in the game at this point, considering how CIG is trying to make every ship have its benefits? This just feels like a stepping stone more towards anything else. Um, thanks a ton. Keep up the awesome content. You're very welcome. So the Aurora is a ship that I think is going to be fairly limited. It is a starter ship for a reason. And there's not many ships that they label as starter ships. And that's basically the Mustang Alpha and the Aurora. Now, there's different variants in there that open up, and even those variants aren't necessarily labeled as starters. So there's going to be things that the the Aurora does well. It's going to be very inconspicuous. So if you want to talk about like smuggling, I think an Aurora is going to do a really good job because nobody's going to pay attention to one. It's also going to be incredibly cheap to replace or to maintain. So if it takes damage or um, you know even just operating cost, I think it's going to be incredibly low. Uh, you know, having the ability to use the store all box carrying um, you know the the freight units that are that fit in there, I think it does a pretty good job. Like the the amount of cargo you can take for the size of the ship is pretty sufficient. It's going to do a lot of things. Okay, you can do exploring in an Aurora. You can do. Um, you know, cargo in an Aurora. You can do some cargo um, or some, uh, yeah, some cargo missions in an Aurora. Um, you can do some fighting in an Aurora. There's, there's a lot of things that you can do that kind of fit into what the Aurora's capabilities are. But it's going to be a master of none. It's not going to be the best at anything. So it's a good ship to start with because you can take on a lot of roles. But I think your analysis of it being a stepping stone towards other ships is probably dead on. That's not a bad way to start the game, though, and there is a huge amount of people out there that are planning on starting with just an Aurora so they get that feeling of accomplishment once they earn what they really were looking for. So that's the last question for today. If you have your questions, please get them into the comments. Otherwise, I appreciate you all watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day, and take care.